LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com This is the kitchen of tomorrow, a press button dream coming true for Mrs. Housewife. All sorts of wonders are hers at the push of a button, from refrigerator doors to countertops built for big gals or little gals. Don't have to lean over here. What's for dinner? Consult the menus on pictures and dish up something new for a change. Hummingbird wings on toast, maybe. And look where the toaster is. A wave of the hand and presto, down comes a hidden cabinet with the dishes. Mama will feel like a fairy princess with a magic wand in a place like this. We won't be able to get her out of the kitchen, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Right now, the question before the house is, what's cooking and when do we eat? Yes, this is Hillsdale, popularly known as the heart of the San Francisco Peninsula. It is composed of some of the nation's great department stores, many of the leading national chain stores, and important local merchandising names. The 50-acre center is bounded on the south by a large, bustling Sears Roebuck store, on the north by the unique Farmer's Market. The Central Mall is flanked by a well-balanced selection of retail stores in every field and price bracket, which provides all customers with the most complete comparative shopping in the entire area. And there is plenty of free parking, over 5,000 individual parking spaces. Hi. Oh, hi, honey. That's my man. The fellow who invented do-it-yourself. Or maybe it just seems that way. As for me, there are certain things I'd much rather not do for myself. Take driving. I want my car to do most of the work for me. And that's just what my new Ford with optional power assist does. Let me show you. It's the one car designed with a woman in mind. Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is James Howard Kunstler, who joins us to discuss his book, the Geography of Nowhere, The Rise and Decline of America's Man-Made Landscape. First published in 1994, but sadly more relevant than ever, The Geography of Nowhere traces America's evolution from a nation of main streets and coherent communities to a land where every place is like no place in particular, where the cities are dead zones and the countryside is a wasteland of cartoon architecture and parking lots. In elegant and often hilarious prose, Kunstler depicts America's evolution from the pilgrim settlements to the modern car-centric suburb in all its ghastliness, adding up the huge economic, social and spiritual costs that the US is paying for its gas-guzzling lifestyle. It's also a wake-up call for citizens to reinvent the places where we live and work, and to build communities that are once again worthy of our affection. Kunstler proposes that by reviving civic art and civic life, we will rediscover public virtue and a new vision of the common good. The future, he says, will require us to build better places, or the future will belong to other people in other societies. The Geography of Nowhere has become a touchstone work in the decades since its initial publication, its incisive commentary giving voice to the feeling of millions of Americans that their nation's suburban environments are ceasing to be credible human habitats. We examine what has changed during the intervening years and ask, in the shadow of looming political, social, economic and environmental crises, whether anything worthwhile might be salvaged from the wreckage that America's suburban sprawl must inevitably become. Hello and welcome James and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's a pleasure to be here, Greg. Now, today, James, we're going to be talking about a book of yours that actually came out some decades ago, but is uh, sadly more relevant than ever, or maybe, as you, you as the author, happily more relevant than ever. Uh, the book's entitled The Geography of Nowhere, The Rise and Decline of America's Man-Made Landscape. Before we jump into that, just tell listeners a little bit about your background and your work in general. 
Well, um, I, I've basically been a journalist, or at least up, up until that point, I was functioning as a journalist and a novelist. Um, I had worked on several newspapers. I was an editor at Rolling Stone magazine. And when I was a newspaper reporter, I experienced the OPEC oil embargoes of 1973, which was uh, quite a trauma for the, for the USA. It really threw the country into uh, a, 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 a tizzy. Um, especially the long lines at the gasoline stations. And, you know, it became very evident at that moment in history what a fiasco the suburban living arrangement had become. And, you know, we just took it for granted that that's how you did stuff. And turned out that it, you know, it was a bad idea. Um, and then we, you know, then we got over that and, uh, we had another, uh, oil crisis in 1979 that accompanied the Iranian revolution when our, you know, our hostages were taken at the embassy and all that. And um, uh, so we had these two uh, incidents which really put, a, put a, a strain on the American living arrangement. And you could – it was quite clear to the sentient observer that this living arrangement had rather poor prospects going into the future. And, uh, that was the takeoff for the geography of nowhere. I had, I had, as far as books went, I had written eight novels at that point and I had not done any nonfiction, but I did have that previous experience as a journalist and I kind of went back to something that I already knew how to do. So just to put this in context, I sort of mentioned when the book came out, it's actually 1993, just so people are aware. Now it's a very, a very personal book and I have only just actually recently read it. Um, well, in, within the last few weeks. Um, oh, good. There's going to be a quiz. Oh, okay. There's going to be a test at the end. Okay, I like that. But yeah, it's a very personal book, you know. And you, in it, you speak very passionately about y your subjects. Uh, so I'm just wondering, from your personal perspective, when was it in your life that? I mean, obviously, there's an overlap. You mentioned the, you know, the sort of oil crisis and what have you. There's all sorts of factors playing into this. But for you personally, have you always had an interest in in architecture or time planning, you know, that built environment, the places that we live in? Or was it Yes, some... I did. Okay, well tell I us. I did. Tell and us. and um a lot of it had to do with my particular upbringing. I was born in uh, New York City. Um uh, my parents moved into the suburbs uh, in a place that's called Long Island off of the uh uh, you know, off the coast uh, of, of New York City. And um, we returned to live in Manhattan in the middle of New York City when my parents got divorced uh, after three years in the suburbs. Um, so I, I experienced the suburbs as a, a small child, and I experienced living in the center of uh, New York City in Manhattan uh, for the rest of my childhood. And I also, every summer, I went up into New England uh, to, uh, a, a boys camp for the summer, for the whole summer, every year after year. And one of the features of that was, uh, you know, there was a nearby small town. And as we got older, they used to take us in there on Thursday evenings. And we had our choice of going to a, a street dance or a movie. And I often used that time to just wander around the town because I, I was fascinated by never having lived in a real American Main Street town. I was kind of fascinated by, by how it worked. And uh, so I, I explored it a lot uh, in those years. So I had lived in these. And also later on, uh, when I left uh, for college, I, I left Manhattan and I also went to another small Main Street town in the furthest remote reaches of upstate New York, very far from New York. So I experienced living in these places. And, um, you know, I had a different reaction to all of them. And... Uh, I developed uh, quite an interest in the American living arrangement in its different incarnations. Yeah, well, at the start of the book, you go right back, really, to the birth of the, the USA as a, the, the nation that it currently is, talking a lot about the European settlers who came across and how they viewed the uh, sort of the open expanse in front of them and how they developed that and the different ways they did that and how American cities grew to, uh, as really from the start as centers of, of commerce more than anything else. And a lot has been written, of course, about the differences between the states in Europe in terms of how the, our cities look, how they function. Most of European cities, obviously, by necessity, being much older, uh, Native Americans just didn't build like that. It wasn't, that just wasn't what they were about. Um, so it's almost like 
reading the book is like this kind of where we are now is somehow inevitable. There would have had to have been a big change in attitude and perspective somewhere along the line for America to turn out differently than it has. Um, I have a new theory of history, which is that things happen because they seem like a good idea at the time, right? Uh, World War I seemed like a good idea at the time. Didn't turn out that way, though, did it? Um, suburbanizing the United States seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, when we, when we first got here, obviously, uh, you know, there were a kind of universal build, building methodology, um, in Europe and the United States. You know, the, the first iterations of Boston and Philadelphia were not that different from traditional European towns or cities. But, uh, you know, the, the real change comes with, uh, first the railroad, which, which hyper concentrates cities that are growing at a furious rate and scale and produces a kind of a strange new thing in the world, uh, uh, in New York and Chicago, pretty much, uh, the skyscraper city. And then, uh, you know, uh, a couple of decades after that process begins, the automobile invades the landscape and we decide that, um, uh, you know, for various reasons, we don't like cities that much now in America because they have grown up in tandem with the industrial experience, at least most, you know, much of them. So after the First World War, when the car really comes on the scene in a big way and Mr. Henry Ford uh, has invented the assembly line method for the for making Model T's. Um, you, we decant the cities of, uh, we begin the process of decanting the cities of its middle class and sending them out to the suburbs for country life, country living. And, um, uh, unfortunately what happens is that after the second world war, uh, the hiatus of the great depression and the war, uh, when we resume the suburban project with a vengeance, it's no longer really country living. It's a cartoon of country living in a cartoon of the, of the country. And, uh, that has ended up being kind of the fundamental problem of suburbia, um, apart from its economic, uh, uh, disadvantages is the fact that it, you know, it's not what it advertises it, itself to be. And, and it falls so far short of that. And it's, uh, uh, quite unrewarding place to live. You mentioned the issues around, you know, the industrial revolution and, and the development of cities and the, the problems thereof and it made cities such unple unpleasant places to be. But, you know, many of these workers at the lower end of the, the food chain, uh, needed to be close to where they worked, you know, the new factories and, and various industrial plants and what have you. But European cities had the same issues. But why do you think the response was different? Why did the US sort of, it seems like an obvious thing to do in some ways, you know, decamp outside of the city to get away from this stuff. But yeah. there were some responses like that in, in some European cities, but it just didn't, uh, the whole thing didn't roll out in the same fashion. Well, because European cities did not gr grow up from the very start, hand in hand with the industrial process and, and uh, with industrialism, um, they had a lot of amenities that American, uh, cities didn't have, and, and they were not designed sheerly for the, uh, for the sale of real estate. Um, Europeans never really lost the idea that there was something really good about city life, and Americans did lose that. Uh, Amer uh, Europeans didn't, they had, uh, European civilization was a lot older. You had very different, um, property ownership arrangements. You know, I, I know that in England, uh, for example, in, in, in London, uh, the 99 year lease was a very common form of, uh, land holding. You know, th that, that barely exists in the United States. Um, so we have all these different, uh, uh, responses to the city. And, um, after the Second World War in the United States, our cities had been neglected for a generation. You know, uh, they were neglected during the Great Depression and during the, the war itself. And they weren't very nice places when the soldiers came back from fighting. Uh, in fact, there was a TV show on in the early 1950s called The Honeymooners that took place in a kind of a squalid New York apartment with a view of the air shaft from the only window in the, on the set. 
And um, I don't know if you if you uh, folks in the UK ever saw that, but you know it became kind of the universal uh, uh, image for Americans of what city life had come to, and they rejected it completely. They they didn't want to live in Ralph Cramden's apartment, his crummy apartment in the city. So they they went out into the suburbs, and um, uh, unfortunately, the American suburbs. Um, are a, a living arrangement with no future for a lot of practical reasons, you know, not the least of them being that we face real um, questions over our, over our ability to continue getting enough oil to, to run the suburbs the way they've been designed to run. You mentioned the skyscrapers earlier, kind of, the, you know, the, the, the dawn of, of that sort of building. And, of course, we had the Roaring Twenties, when a lot of, uh, you know, when people commuting and doing things like that began to be established. But it was really, you're just referred to the 1950s, it was really after the Second World War that this thing went into overdrive. And it certainly, if we think back to utopian thinking, which incidentally has blighted many fields of human endeavor, if we sure. think of like the utopian thinking about the future for America, really the 1950s is where most of the cliches come from, you know, from the Jetsons through to the these enormous cars about the size of swimming pools and swimming pools the size of allotments and, <laughs> and what have you. And oddly enough, during the, the war, the Nazis and even the Soviets disliked, maybe that's too mild a word, uh, modernism, but they kind of, the, what transpired through those regimes was kind of consolidation of modernism the Nazis were neoclassicists, and so were the Soviets, and and because that was the language of authority, and of course authoritarian regimes are very interested in the architectural language of authority. And um, at the at by the the end of the war, um, that tended to discredit neoclassicism completely. And uh, you know we adopted instead this new thing called modernism, uh, which became the the architectural language of democracy and decency. It, it's interesting to see in Berlin, though, what happened uh, when uh, Stalin died in '53, and when uh, Nikita Khrushchev consolidated his power around 1955 or six. He started to look at at the West and to see the kind of things we were building in America, like shopping, the first shopping malls and, and, and uh, stuff like that. And he decided that he was going to uh, make communism and, and the Soviet regime more up-to-date. So they started building uh, modernist things. Uh, you, you, one of the uh, uh, signature projects was the Alexander Plots in, in East Berlin, which is kind of funny because it, it includes a very large uh, radio TV tower, but the main part of the Alexander Plots is basically a shopping mall with no shopping, because the Soviets didn't believe in shopping. So uh, the, um, they go through this weird kind of transition themselves. Well, it was interesting to see how this whole trend was facilitated and enabled, really, by transport systems that allowed people to do more than just walk from A to B, you know, from, from home to work or whatever. But the, Quite so. Yeah, the advent of the, the car, then you saw moves to basically shut down or just to, you know, benign neglect, or I should say maybe malign neglect on, on real uh, infrastructure, for example, that to, in favor of the car, because that was really seen as, you know, that's, this is the future, not trams, not buses, not public transport, basically. It's a private, transport very much yeah and that's something that we, we often think today i mean I, I know quite a few americans and they they talk kind of with disgust about the uh the, the, you know the bus network and the real network and the state that it's in in america but that where it's at now really started a long time ago uh yeah um it's also important to note that um after the second world war the uh european participants were were quite broke and impoverished and um, you know, the, uh, their citizens could not just go out and buy Chevrolets the way Americans did. Moreover, um, America had its own oil supply. It was the, yeah, after the Second World War, it was, it was still the leading oil producer in the world. And oil was quite cheap and gasoline was quite cheap, which was not the case in Europe. So it took them, you know, two or three decades actually to, to get to the point in, in the UK and Germany, uh, and France where 
commuting American style was even possible for a large class of citizens. One of the things about the road network, um, well, in, in most countries actually, but certainly we're, we're talking now about the situation in the USA, is this basically being constructed at, usually at public expense. So it's one of these massive externalities for, in, in this case, the, the auto industry. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of commerce in general, you know, because like trucks driving all over the country delivering stuff do so on publicly constructed roads. And that's one of these things where, you know, it's like if that the cost of constructing all that infrastructure had been borne by corporations who were going to be making a lot of use and making money out of it, suddenly their enterprises might not actually have been profitable. So that's a huge issue. And of course, now you see, perhaps you can talk about your take on the state of uh, the uh, transport infrastructure in the US at the moment. But certainly the news stories I see tend to be along the lines of bridges, roads, you name it, all sorts of things are just falling apart. And yeah. even some more rural roads, you know, are being allowed to go back to, you know, not a, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, like a metal surface, if you know what I mean, uh, they're going back no, to... No, they've been uh, depaved, it's called. Right, okay. Let me just answer your question, because um, I'm one of those who believe that there is a direct relationship between a society's energy supplies and uh, their their financial situation generally. And what allowed us to do those gigantic public works projects of the 20th century, uh, especially the American uh, interstate highway system, was the fact that we had this tremendous amount of cheap energy, of cheap oil. And now that that's become problematical, now that the oil is is no longer cheap and, and the supply of it is getting sketchier every year, um, the main consequence of that is that we we can no longer generate the kind of debt that we have been used to generating and operating with. So, you know, uh, these public works projects were, were, were paid for, um, with bonds and we're losing our ability to, to issue bonds and we're entering a period of history where, um, uh, there's a very good, uh, uh, possibility that a lot of money will not ever be paid back. So that is, is making it much more difficult for us to maintain the stuff that we have. That's what's at the the root of this, isn't it? Really, the energy situation and the kind Absolutely. of the, the voodoo economics, obviously, is like part of that. But that's a lot of that has arisen in an effort to kind of cover up a lot of the other. Well, the whole the whole uh, process of running a society on bonds and on debt is really a way of borrowing from the future to to speed up your you know doing what you want to do today by borrowing from the future what's happening is that uh we're losing our ability to plausibly borrow from the future because there's every reason to expect that we won't be able to pay the future back and and when that faith is lost you start to develop serious problems in the bond markets and in finance finance generally yeah, you write about these specific issues a lot in your, your blog posts, the colorfully titled Clusterfuck Nation, which people can find at your website. But it's, in essence, uh, for a long time, the financial world became, it's become detached from the kind of real world of stuff, as it were. And all that we have available to us to do things, no matter what those things are, are the resources on the earth. Uh, you know, whether it's human labor, which is limited by the number of people, or whether it's yeah. oil, or whether it's, you know, any resources that we pull from or the earth. Or sunshine. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's part of it. And these things yeah. are, they might be enormous resources, or might have been enormous resources, but they're finite. Everything in that sense is finite. And I think that's increasingly becoming emergent. And obviously there's a lot of cognitive dissonance around this and a lot of resistance to the reality, but we're increasingly being brought back to like what we can do is limited by what we actually have, and no amount of bonds or paper money or anything else or electronic money will change the amount of oil or any other resource that there is. Yeah, and that leads me to certain conclusions about where we're going with the built environment in in Western societies, uh, and in America in particular, uh, it suggests that we're going to have to get a lot more local and a lot more a lot smaller. And we're going to have to downscale just about all of the activities that, that we have. And I think that this is going to play out on the ground in our towns and cities in a particular way that the American public is not at all prepared for. For one thing, you know, the dilemma of the decrepitating suburbs leads a lot of people to think that – 
well, when the suburbs get into trouble and start to fail, everybody will just move to Brooklyn or something like it, you know. And I, I think that that is actually not what's going to happen because this, the big cities have exceeded their plausible scale um, in the context of the resource and capital realities of the future, of the near future. And the cities are going to get into a lot of trouble, too. They're going to have to contract substantially. And the process is going to be very, is going to be punishing, uh, both in terms of the loss of real estate value and the loss of wealth and probably conflict between various groups of people about who gets to inhabit the remaining valuable parts of the existing cities. And those cities, after all, are where they are because they occupy important sites, uh, you know, on inland waterways or harbors or rail lines or what have you. So the cities are going to get into trouble. The suburbs are going to get into trouble. And I think what we're going to see as the as we're compelled to relocalize is that a lot of the forgotten places, the small cities and small towns in America are going to turn out to be where the action is uh, for several reasons. One is that they are scaled better for the energy and capital realities of the future and the lean kind of societies that we are going to become and also because many of them have a meaningful relationship with food production and farming and the places that don't have that meaningful relationship with food production are also going to get into trouble and and by that in the USA I mean places like Phoenix Arizona and uh, Los Angeles and you know places like that uh, so we're going to see quite I think a, a, demogra a demographic shift from the kinds of places that we've been used to living in to uh, new arrangements. Uh, and, and many of those new arra arrangements will actually be a return to older arrangements. Now, you mentioned farming there, and that actually brings me on to a point uh, that was coming to anyway, which is you know, farming and food was hugely affected by the big developments, both in industry, but also in uh, transport and how we lived. And, and not generally for the better you know we went from having family farms that were mixed uh, use through to these great industrial monoculture type farms and there's always been that slight it used to puzzle me before I really looked into it it used to puzzle me many years ago particularly when I was growing up how I was hearing stories about farmers going out of business but at the same time we were importing more and more of our food and yeah. that everybody I knew was buying milk every day but dairy farmers couldn't make a profit. And I, none of it seemed to make any sense to me. What we consume, that has almost followed a similar kind of trajectory, uh, you know, as well since industrialization, but the kind of dumbing down of, you know, the places that we live and how we do things has been kind of mirrored in, in, in kind of what we eat. I suppose it's to be expected, isn't it? Because it's the same factors have affected all these aspects of our lives. Yeah, well, you know, the industrial diet that Americans consume of, pepperoni sticks and and uh, chips of every imaginable kind and you know fatty processed sugary stuff it's just deadly but you know it's coming from a food industry that has had a hundred years to rationalize itself in a particular way uh, I think the the crucial point is it's probably not going to be able to continue the way it has uh, in many respects first of all uh, the farming itself which uh, requires enormous inputs, as they call them, of uh, fossil fuel-based uh, herbicides and fertilizers and pesticides. Um, but it also requires uh, enormous inputs of capital. You know, they have to borrow hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to put those crops on those thousands and thousands of, of acres of gigantic Iowa farms. And uh, I think that the industrial farming method is going to is probably going to be discontinued and what that suggests is we're going to have to grow food with a lot more human attention on the land and probably at a smaller scale uh probably or possibly using more animal power and fewer uh, uh, uh gasoline diesel powered machines and um that's going to be a big change uh, we may not be able to feed the current population of, of the world. And, and uh, it's going to be a big challenge. Oh, I think population decline over time is going to be a big factor in future as well. You know, we can't sustain 
the numbers of people that we've got, then I think it'll just be more a case of not so much apocalyptic fantasies about die-offs and, and uh, disease outbreaks or whatever, but more just the like, less people being born. I think there'll be a kind of attrition. Now, now remember that, um, uh, you know, I wrote a book in 2005 called The Long Emergency, which was about this period of history that we are entering now, a period of, uh, uh, you know, fairly, fairly extreme difficulty, especially involving resources and money. And, uh, but part of the, the, I think the pattern we'll, we'll discover is that of course, people continue to have sex even during periods of hardship, and sex will produce children often. And so, you know, I think the population may go up for a while, even when it becomes self-evident that the civilized world is uh, entering a form of economic reset. You know, something some people call it collapse. I think collapse may be a little bit extreme, although, uh, I, you know, I, that's arguable. But we're certainly going to reset to a different kind of standard of, of economy. And uh, I think it'll be there'll be an overhang of continued population growth until after that becomes very clear and, and probably until practical matters make it much more difficult for people to uh, raise children. Yeah, there's just a little anecdote that I've told before that I'll throw in here and share with you. I worked on a farm for a year. It was an organic farm. Uh, the farmer had actually taken the decision to go organic. He used to raise pigs, but uh, he went over to organic produce, vegetables. Uh, it's just a business thing, really, because he thought it had a future and the products could command a premium over and above just doing basic non-organic stuff. But yeah. anyway, the point being is that it, not having done that sort of work before, I had grown fruit and vegetables from I was very young, but I, it was so humanly labor intensive. Now, we had machines, but uh, he didn't use any uh, agrochemicals. And that was, again, I had, he had to do that in order to be certified organic. Yeah. But um, this was I was I think when I got the job, I was like 42 or something. And I remember having, to, having a conversation with him one day. And he was always looking for people to work on the farm. You know, there were some guys there that had been there for years, but generally speaking, there was a there was a high churn rate. And I said, yeah. well, you've got all these young people who are like unemployed and they've got nothing to do and they say they can't get any jobs. They come and do this. You know, one of the pluses was that we could uh, take as much produce as we, we could carry at the end of the day for ourselves on top of what we got paid. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, sometimes young people get sent here by the employment agency. Uh, they basically said to him, look, you go and do this work. Otherwise, you don't get any benefits, any state financial benefits. And he said, I, they can't do it. He said, we're talking young people like 16, 17, 18. Uh, sure. They cannot cope with it. He said, I've had people show up here. I tell them, okay, seven o'clock. 7 o'clock Monday morning, show up here, we start work. He said some of them have gone on their lunch break at noon and they just haven't come back again. They, they couldn't cope with the work. It was traumatic to them to actually... Well, it's not at all surprising. I mean, uh, agriculture is a culture that, uh, you know, people really have to grow up into in order to be successful at it in that way, you know, doing, doing a lot of hands-on, uh, uh, you know, close management of the land and caretaking. So... Uh, you know, it's, it's something that is best, uh, done in families over generations. And, and that has gone away. So, of course, you take these people who are used to sitting around looking at the telly and, and eating Smarties. And you, you know, you put them on the farm and you know, they don't want to do that. I'm reminded of your World Made by Hand series now, but I think going forward, there's going to be a lot of what I could generally call heritage skills, you know, like woodworking, metalworking. Oh, for sure. Doing, that tailoring. Uh, repairing shoes, you name it, that's going to have to be relearned. And you know? for the benefit of your listeners, um, uh, Greg is referring to a series of four novels I published in the over the last uh, eight years under the rubric World Made by Hand. And they were all about a kind of uh, what an, an American small town might be going through after an economic uh, catastrophe. And things uh, in, in that... Story in that long extended story, uh, 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 life has changed quite a bit in the United States. So it's, you know, it's, uh, I think it's funny and interesting and, and, uh, amusing and entertaining and edifying. So if you're interested, look for the world made by hand series. Well, let's talk a little bit about shopping. There's a website, uh, and indeed the guy who does the website published a book. The website's called Abandoned America. 
And oh yeah, you, uh, you may be aware of it yet. Yeah, no, as to what it does. What oh, it he sit- came to see me. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well that's great because I always have enjoyed looking at his new photographs, new series of photographs when they come out. This is a chap yeah. who goes around and photographs abandoned America. But one of the most, one of the recurring themes in his photographs is shopping malls. You know, yeah. with, with the roofs caving in and puddles of water everywhere. That's something you mentioned earlier with the shopping mall phenomenon. That, again, was another thing that came out, particularly in the 1950s. We think of all the happy motoring, but also happy shopping cliches that are there. And that's something that's beginning to go away. In fact, only today, I just bookmarked an article while you and I were offline temporarily to read later this evening, which is about high street closures of long-standing retail chains here in the UK. And that, that's, yeah. that's a constant theme now. Retail closures, job losses, downsizing. Some of the top names in UK retail have just vanished in the last 10, 15 years. And I know similar things are happening in the US. Yes. And it's not at all just because of online shopping. In fact, uh, you know, I've seen the numbers and online shopping only, um, uh, is only responsible for a very small percentage of, uh, what is, what is eating away at the old brick and mortar retail. So yes, we're having a lot of store closings and mall closings in the United States. The middle class is being incrementally immiserated and impoverished and they simply don't have the money to spend anymore on stuff and 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 they're not spending it so uh so uh you know we'll see where that goes my guess is that uh shopping uh you know we're we're gonna, gonna continue to exchange goods and services there will be trade but it's not going to be the frantic exercise that it has been in the late 20th early 21st century it's going to be more, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be more in the background of everyday life, um, as it, as it was. And, uh, this is the beginning of that trend. And, uh, you know, get ready for it. The street I live on used to be, there used to be almost no residential on it whatsoever. It was all pretty ugly looking car dealerships, uh, a supermarket. Really? Yeah. Where are you in York? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What would, would, would I think if I saw your street? Would I think I was in Michigan? Uh, you wouldn't think you were in York, UK. Let's put it that way. Yeah. The location is very good in the sense it's very convenient. But what's happened here is that a lot of the commercial operations have been replaced by new residential developments. Car dealerships have gone. Where I am sitting right now used to be a car dealership that was demolished years ago. One of the, th- of the commercial operations remaining on the street, there's a big carpets and bedding warehouse on the corner of the street. And that has 24-7, 365 days a year, must end Thursday sale. <laughs> <laughs> but Not it, a good harbinger. No, but it must end Thursday in order that they can start the next sale, if you see what I mean. <laughs> yeah, all right. So I, s- I, I see this a lot. This is a... Um, I know we've been predominantly talking about North America, but the, the, these phenomena are cropping up all over the place in, you know, in modern industrial sure. uh, economies. I've never seen, this is a uh, upper middle class, relatively prosperous city, but I've never seen more vacant units, uh, you know, retail units than at their, yep. uh, their existence right now. All sorts of stores. It's just, it's, it's sale, sale, sale to the point where it's like, you know, crying wolf. It has no effect anymore. Nobody gets excited by seeing a sign in a window that says, you know, everything must go. Well, I, you know, I dare say that the economy of the UK may be as fragile, if not more, than the economy of the USA. And to some extent, a Potemkin economy, kind of a false front economy, with the city of London being the false front and all of the uh, uh, financial finaglings that that are more and more um, occupying the economy of the UK. So, you know, uh, uh, this is uh, what's happening you know, also in the United States with our uh, Potemkin economy of Wall Street. So thinking about the housing market and the trends that we've been talking about, how where things have come from, where we are now and where you see them headed, what kind of uh, effects are you seeing in the US and we had a the 2008 financial crisis had quite an effect on the property market here both residential and commercial I mean commercial property it's in a lot of the UK has been a car crash for a long time um, mm-hmm. but in terms of 
home values, sales? Are you seeing any trends towards what you've been talking about? People, you know, city living becoming more viable, or, 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 suburban housing becoming less desirable? Well, sure. Um, you know, especially as you go outward from most American cities, the suburbs have have iterated and reiterated themselves in a, in sets of you know different uh, decades of of rings around the city. And as you go outward, uh, you know the 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 earliest ones are now decrepit and uh, in many places have become the new ghetto for for the um, the permanent poor class, the underclass. Um, you know, the other thing is is that in general, American suburbia was built so poorly that uh you know the buildings are not going to last in any case the the houses are made out of what's called strand board which is just glued together wood chips and vinyl in other words plastic and uh you know they they have a very very they have very poor prospects for enduring into the future and for adaptive reuse and, um, you know, the, a lot of the commercial buildings and institutional buildings, whether they're shopping strips or schools, are just boxes with flat roofs. And it's the same box whether you're in Florida or Minnesota. Uh, you know, the problem being when you're in, when you're in Minnesota, that flat roof box gets a very deep snow load. And over time, the roof deteriorates, uh, pretty quickly. So, uh, you know, we're going to have problems just with the, the junk that we've smeared all over the landscape. And one of the things that I expect is that salvage will become a very big industry in the USA because we're not going to have the energy to refabricate uh, or, to, or to fabricate the kinds of materials that we have been used to, you know, whether they're aluminum trusses or plywood or sheetrock uh, or any of these things so or, or cinder blocks, uh, concrete blocks which take enormous amounts of energy to manufacture. So I think what you'll see is that, uh, you know, there's, there are going to be huge salvage operations to, to uh, you know, sort this stuff out and reuse it. Um, and one of the things that human beings are good at is sorting. You know, if you, if you put a couple of people in front of a big pile of stuff and you come back uh, three hours later – You'll find all the copper in one pile and all the aluminum in another pile. And, you know, they're, they're real good at it. So that's going to be a big deal going forward. And, um, that, by the way, uh, you know, leads to, uh, w one of the other reasons that the skyscraper cities are going to be in trouble. Um, because the skyscrapers will not be renovated. The capital is not going to be there to do it on that scale. And it's very likely that many of the modular building materials will not be available going into the future. Things that, that seem very humble, like, uh, like what the, the substance that we call sheetrock or gypsum board. I don't know what you call it in the UK, but people think that's a humble a product. It's actually very complicated. You know, it, it requires uh, long supply and manufacturing chains and mining chains for the gypsum that goes into it. And, you know, it's not something that you just whack together in a, in, you know, in a cottage industry. So, uh, I think what we're going to discover is that a lot of the megastructures in New York and London and Chicago, uh, these megastructures are going to turn out very, very soon to be liabilities rather than assets. And it's going to come as a tremendous shock to the real estate industry and the property industry. And um, it's going to be a kind of a fiasco for the people who, you know, have ownership in them, especially especially those who are entailed in the condi condominium model of financing, where, you know, you have a megastructure of 100 apartment units and you break each one up into a separate ownership and uh, then you create a homeowner or property owners association to manage the property. Yeah, I've read some articles about that kind of living arrangement in the U.S. and some of the problems associated with it. Uh, well, let me just say, uh, forgive me again for interrupting. The important part is that whole method for financing large buildings was only possible as the world was going up the great mountain of debt that we have ascended. As we go down the other side, it's going to be a whole other matter. 
And what we're going to discover is that model does not work. And a lot of those uh, property owners associations are going to fail, and it's going to be a, a quite a catastrophe. Well, you mentioned uh, whatever the perceived advantages of suburbia you mentioned earlier about the, you know the, the, the how that apartment living city living in that soap opera or whatever it was you mentioned earlier it was a tv comedy it was what's called a sitcom <clears throat> yes yeah, sitcom that was rejected i do recall that the building of tower blocks apartments or flats as we call them here usually in the uk a lot of that that went on during the 1960s somewhat started in the 50s but it had a big boom in the 1960s and how that was, you know, the utopian vision of the, the future, which turned out to be just a kind of like concrete cancer. And, and that was ultimately rejected. And people they found actually quite liked the Victorian terraces or row housing, as you would call them in the States. They actually, uh-huh. li- they actually liked that type of property. And mm-hmm. it, so it kind of amazed me that I, we found ourselves, uh, you know, in the 21st, early 21st century going back to building albeit better quality, or at least better looking, tower blocks full of flats again, you know, full of apartments, yeah. and uh, you, you, which you were mentioning a moment ago. And yeah, that's when anything like that hits a problem, it's going to be a mess. Because you say, if you've got 100 apartments, almost 100 different owners, uh, but none of whom is responsible for the maintenance of the roof, for example, like in the apartment that I live in here, it's very small development, but you know, the roof is the management company are responsible for maintaining the roof. They're responsible for washing the windows. They're responsible for the communal garden areas. Not having ever gone through the paperwork in detail, I'm not quite sure where my responsibilities begin and end in terms of the structure. I mean, well, the problem is that it, it only takes a small number of the members of the property owners association or management association uh, to not pay their their annual dues or um, or to uh, go bankrupt or to stop paying their mortgages for the for that model of, of management to fail. That's the problem. Uh, a relatively small number of people can can prang uh, that sort of uh, uh, financial organization. So you know we, we, we have yet to see that. All of this activity with this form of financing occurred over the last 40 years. While we were borrowing more and more and more and more money everywhere in every place. And that trend is now, uh, about to reverse, is reversing in a, in a very big way. And it's going to affect all these, uh, relationships. There's actually, I suddenly remembered two little points, two little diversions that I was going to throw in when we were talking about car culture that I, for- yeah. I forgot at the time, so I'm just going to put those in now before they- I forget again. Uh, one was that in terms of car commercials on the television, I don't watch a great deal of television, but I, sometimes you see car commercials now online, you go visit a website and you want to look at some content and before you do it, you've got to sit through a car commercial. But compared to those that were, <laughs> you know, compared to those that were around when I was younger, I don't see so many now that show open roads with like no other cars on it. A typical yeah. thing here in the UK was a new car. You'd see the new model BMW driving through the Scottish Highlands, idyllic mm-hmm. landscape, and not another vehicle in sight. Uh, nothing, mm-hmm. to, nothing to slow you down. It was all about freedom and uh, no restrictions on your movement. So I'm seeing a lot less of that now. Those those sort of commercials don't really exist. And also, yeah. I had a friend of mine who visited Florida a couple of years ago, and he was staying in a motel, not f- a little bit out of downtown, but not so far. It was walkable. So he decided to walk from his motel to downtown just to go to a bar, a restaurant, whatever. And um, he, at one point, he's walking along the sidewalk, and then the sidewalk didn't exist anymore. But he's still making oh, yeah. making his way downtown, and the, the cops actually in a car actually pulled over to ask him what he was doing. And he said, oh, right. you know, they, they basically insisted that he get in the car, and they drove him downtown. They, they didn't want to let him keep walking. Well, that's interesting. And, and of course, it's true that when you're in that milieu and uh, – you're in a place like Florida or, or, you know, the suburbs of Atlanta or Houston or Southern California. A- anybody who is not in a car is deemed to be some kind of a, uh, a loser, <laughs> and possibly a criminal. Uh, and, uh, because, uh, you know, o- only a loser would be walking down the street. So sure. And, and of course, you know, it should go without saying that the journey from point A to point B along one of those six laners is not a pleasant journey. It's not, it's not cognitively rewarding and, uh, you know, it makes people feel bad. So the whole situation is pretty, pretty grotesque. 
So I'm going to get a little bit, change tack a little bit here, maybe get a little bit metaphysical, but this isn't all just about economics or the environment or whatever. You know, there's a, there's a, maybe to say spiritual dimension. I don't think it's too big a phrase, you know, because the places that we live in do affect how we feel. We know that. I mean, it stands to reason, but I think it's maybe at a deeper level than we realize. And I think in many ways that the, the built environment, the, the places we're in reflect what's inside us in a way. You know, they reflect something about the society that we have built, that we have allowed to grow. And I've, I've read about architecture in, in the context of people like Rudolf Steiner and Buckminster Fuller and different approaches to doing this. And I actually wanted to be an architect when I was a kid because I, I was always amazed at the lack of uh, thought and care that seemed to go into buildings, even if their function was very rudimentary. I thought there's no reason for everything just to be a square box with little tiny square windows. You know, what's wrong with a round window or a triangular window? Why can't we do this? And it just seemed to be all about, oh, well, it costs money, blah, blah, blah. So long story short, I think that places that we make for ourselves reflect something in ourselves, and I think they have a huge effect on us as well. And of course, how can we thrive in some of these places? Is it any surprise that that they're that's taking such a toll on us? Uh, no, and in fact, uh, it's it's not even that metaphysical. It's actually a very straightforward thing. You know, if if people do not live in places that are worthy of their affection, they suffer. Uh, uh, you know, the artistry in our everyday surroundings is what informs us that we're human. It informs us that life is worth living. It informs us that we ought to feel gratitude for being here at all. And these are very, very, you know, central uh, uh, issues of our existence. Um, uh, the artistry that we see in, in you know, earlier uh, moments of history and in, in, of civilized history in Western culture, the artistry that we see is kind of a, a bulwark against the entropy that is always present in the world that never sleeps, you know, and entropy is that force in the universe that moves things towards stasis and uh, disorder and death. And and it is the artistry that we bring to creating surroundings that uh, inform us about why life is worth living that uh, makes that so crucial and important. And, you know, what is characteristic of of the American living arrangement in in uh, in recent decades is that it is stupendously devoid of artistry, and therefore st- stupendously devoid of any love and care taken in in its creation. And, and we interpret that as you know living in places that are not worth caring about. Uh, when you have enough places that aren't worth caring about in your culture or your nation, then you'll have a nation that's not worth uh, carrying forward, and it's as simple as that. Okay, well, in terms of all these trends that we've been discussing, um, as mentioned earlier, um, your book came out in 93. You started work on it actually in the late 80s. Um, from your perspective, for better or worse, what has changed in the meantime, I read a lot of stories about the aforementioned decaying infrastructure in the U.S., crumbling cities, social problems. And you mentioned earlier about increasing trends towards localism that you feel will be desirable and essential, actually, if we're going to have any type of future. So what, what do you think has changed in the interim? Are there some things that you'd have expected to be more pronounced trends that haven't really manifested? Are there maybe other things that have accelerated faster than you thought they would? Probably the most striking change was something that began when the Geography of Nowhere book came out. You know, sometimes there are strange uh, synchronicities in in our life and in history. And um, when that book was published in 1993, it was the same year that an organization called the Congress for the New Urbanism was forming. And it was a major reform effort uh, started by a group of architects developers, land property developers, um, municipal officials, some attorneys and journalists, uh, a pretty um, uh, broad uh, bunch of people. And uh, the idea was to reform uh, 
the the building customs and habits that we had arrived at in the United States, it became a very potent movement. And uh, the new urbanists uh, created some wonderful models for for uh, future development of compact, walkable communities. And they also went all about the United States and, and in actually plenty of places overseas and helped municipal officials write uh, codes that would regulate um, uh, building in such a way that that you you would not get a suburban sprawl man mandated outcome and that was the problem in the United States was that the combination of the ev- the evolved body of laws and codes combined with the the sloppy habits of the builders and the loss of knowledge and the um imperatives of the motoring community combined to make it almost impossible to build anything that did not come out in some way as suburban sprawl. So the new urbanist movement uh, began a battle against this, and um, uh, they were quite successful. They, you know, they didn't, uh, 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 they, you know, so much stuff had already been built in the United States that, it, in some ways, you know, that we, the, the project was kind of over. But we've now entered a new era with a new set of principles and a new way of understanding um, how to make places that are worth caring about. And the new urbanists did a tremendous job of diving into the dumpster of history and retrieving knowledge that had been thrown away by several generations of uh, architects and urban designers. And so we are, you know, we now have the tools to do a lot of this stuff right that we weren't doing before. Uh, we also now have the economic imperative to do it that way because it's becoming more and more manifest that we can't afford to live in a car dependent culture in a decrepitating suburban matrix. So, so, uh, that was the, the biggest change. And, um, you know, the, the other changes are on the way. Well, you mentioned about, uh, you know, sort of regulations and policies and what have you. And, uh, steering things in a certain direction and some of the what uh, you know on the face of it are positive developments that i've noticed in various industrial countries but in the u.s in particular have been meeting with some resistance because there's a lot of cognitive dissonance at, at play here about the changes that are happening whether we like it or not and of course human beings being what they are we're sort of like no this isn't happening da 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 i can't you know fingers and ears, don't hear what's going on, don't want to know. For example, two things that spring to mind, you're probably aware of the tiny house movement. You know, I've done an interview sure. with, with a lady there. Uh, people trying to live simpler on a smaller scale, affordable, what have you, and how difficult it can be sometimes to make that happen because of rules and regulations. And talking about zoning, I've certainly read stories about places in the US where if you wanted to do something really straightforward and simple, like it seems perfectly normal, like grow some vegetables in your garden, maybe in your front garden, particularly if, you, if you've only got a bit of green space at the front of your home. Oh, no, that's not allowed because it's kind of sending out bad signals. That, you know, maybe this is an impoverished neighborhood or something like that. People who can't afford to buy all their groceries at the store. Yeah. So uh, there's still a bit of official regulatory resistance to some of these changes that people are trying to make in their own lives you know the codes and the laws are 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 pretty firm in the united states and we you know we have building inspectors who will not give you a certificate of occupancy unless you follow certain rules um uh i'd say that what you're describing is something a little different uh uh, kind of a movement uh, that is an outgrowth of the new urbanism called guerrilla urbanism and this has uh, been taken up especially by some of the younger gen x and and millennial people who who are coming up in the new urbanism and um in places where uh like detroit for example the city of detroit is so impoverished that they can barely afford to even hire people to enforce their codes so as a result uh, young people are doing all kinds of things that are not necessarily entirely legal, uh, 
in refurbishing old buildings in in certain parts of Detroit. Um, it's still largely, you know, a, a desolate and abandoned city, but there are little nodes of activity here and there, and a lot of it is kind of guerrilla urbanism. So there's that. But I think what what you're going to see is that in general, especially in the USA, um, we're going to be so uh, short of money and so short of capital and short of taxes and short of funding that uh, bit by bit, by small increments, we're going to lose the ability to enforce all of these um, labyrinthine uh, codes, building codes and zoning codes. And, you know, they'll simply be ignored and people will do the much more practical common sense things. And a lot of those things will be much sounder in, in every respect. They'll be sounder, uh, environmentally, socially, and, uh, you know, they, they may produce places that people actually care about. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Detroit. There's a chapter towards the end of your book where you profile Detroit and Portland and LA. Uh, yeah. Portland, Oregon, not Portland, Maine, I should say. The reason I mention it is because Detroit is a sort of living example of a city contracting in a, yes. in, in a way that lots of people have assumed can't really happen to modern industrial cities. For example, here in the UK, London and the Southeast in general, but London in particular is like some kind of death star, just pulling yeah. in population and resources and everything's kind of just going there, going there, and the population gets bigger every year. And I now describe what's happening in London as uh, it's metastasizing. It's not growth. Yeah. It's not just growth anymore, which has always got a positive spin on it. And Detroit is a good example that, that this just can't go on forever. And I don't know if I'll live to see the headline, but like London population shrinks would be something just like, wow, really? You know? Well, it will. It probably will happen. And I'm, you know, you have many symptoms there now of distress, not the least of which are the prices in the property uh, mm. market, which up until recently were just going up and up and up with no sign of ever stopping. And now I understand they're crashing. Well, yes. I mean, if we're talking about London in particular, then I think that the, the prices continue to increase, actually. But we're in that phase at the minute where they're just becoming affordable to less and less people to the point where it's just stupid. An example, yeah. an example I like to give is that I used to work for companies in London, though I never lived there, but they were based there. And so some of my colleagues, fellow employees who did live in London, the last decade or so has seen them move from living relatively close to their places of work further and further out into the, the you know so-called suburbs uh, yeah. in actually lower grade accommodation simply because of cost. And there's a big issue. They call, they've had this thing regarding wages called London waiting. Uh, weight as in how heavy something is or how much mm -hmm. of it there is. And this often applies to public employees like uh, prison officers or nurses. And London waiting means that to take into account how much more expensive it is to live and work in London, you get paid more than you would if you were a prison officer or a nurse in the north of England or in the Midlands or in Scotland or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we are right now. But certainly there are a lot of developments being built in london that are not being sold so i mm -hmm. don't think we're really at a price crash just yet but i think certainly the conditions are being set up for that to happen price slumps in property prices in other parts of the uk are absolutely well advanced there's no question about that mm -hmm. yeah we'll i'll stand by to see what happens in london um uh, and i stand i i do stand by my previous statement that i I think that we're going to discover that uh, the UK economy is, um, uh, you know, resting on a very fragile foundation. I'm going to ask you a question totally unscripted here. I hadn't thought about this at all. Brexit, just briefly, what, mm. do, you, what do you make of that? And do you see it? I certainly see it as a, as a, a function of some of the trends we've been talking about. Um, it's happening for a reason. And I actually think that Brexit's got a lot to do are a lot in common with the, the, the election of Trump in the U.S. You know, these are symptoms of something. Mm -hmm. Well, there's. Uh, I think that Brexit is certainly uh, a symptom of the trend uh, for uh, regions to tend to re relocalize. 
And uh, but, you know, you're also you you also have to take into account the um, uh, the unworkability of the European Union government and, and the fact that, you know, they they really have no fiscal responsibility and uh, yet they're they're capable of generating enormous amounts of debt. And that's gotten that's gotten the, the EU into trouble. And um, look. <clears throat> um, free trade is probably uh, the best of all possible worlds, and uh, and it is a good thing when when goods and and uh, money and people can move fairly freely ac- across borders. But I, I don't know that it requires the kind of EU apparatus that you've not now got for that to be the case. You know, you there was an earlier. Um, iteration of globalism between about 1870 and the First World War, and um, you know that that made uh, the borders of Europe fairly porous, and uh, especially for goods and services and money, and um, uh, they did not have they were not uh, uh, burdened by this tremendous uh, you know EU body of law and 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 uh, you know, expensive regulations. So, uh, on the whole, I, I think that, uh, the EU probably isn't going to survive that far into the future. Um, and I hope that, uh, Europe doesn't devolve back into, you know, a set of, uh, warring cultures. I was reminded when we we're just talking about Trump, actually, in your book, when you talk, talk about the period of time the brief period of time when Jimmy Carter was U.S. president and he was tossed out of office unceremoniously. And to quote from your book, talking about Reagan, we replaced him with a movie actor who promised to restore the great enterprise to all its former glory, whatever the costs. And I just thought, wow, Trump, you know, a reality of TV muppet. Oh, yeah. Who promised well, to... <laughs> that, uh, Trump has taken that to a, a whole other lower level. But, uh, yeah, Trump is a symptom of the, really the economic distress that this country faces and its inability to resolve so many of its, uh, problems, many of which involve money and borrowing money and, and, uh, spending money that we don't have. And the, of course, the collapse of the middle class and all of the, the whole armature of, of life that was needed to sustain them and, and to keep families together. So the damage out there is epic. And for the moment, it has been expressed in the election of Trump. And, uh, um, I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about the whole picture. And, um, you know, people who re- read my blog will understand that while I generally deplore Trump, uh, for his lack of decorum and boobery and, 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 uh, you know, apparent idiocy. Uh, I'm even more concerned at the moment about the, the failures of the left and, and the supposedly thinking classes of America who are now uh, engaged in this, uh, Russian conspiracy, uh, hysteria along with a, a sexual harassment hysteria. Um, and I think that, uh, the left is in the process of making itself crazy. And I find that, that even I- at least equally disturbing as, uh, having Trump living in the White House. So, you know, at both ends of the political spectrum, the United States is showing signs of extreme distress. And, uh, you know, it, if it goes any further, we're, we're liable to, to see some very si- serious civil disorder. So just a closing thought, really, I just wanted to ask you about what gives you hope. And I don't know what perhaps you might expect to see in your lifetime. You know, I I don't know if you've got children or not, but, you know, obviously people who do, that that gives them a very sharp focus on what might be happening, not just in their own lifetimes, but maybe in the next century or so. And I don't know, as I just mentioned, for the rest of your life, what developments you might expect to see. Do you think things will inevitably be across the board, somewhat worse in the rest of your days? Do you think you live long enough to see us turn a corner in any meaningful way? First of all, I don't have any children, even though I've been married more than once. Just just happened that way. Um, but uh, 
you know, I'm I'm a pretty cheerful guy. I I, I don't. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't walk around with a cloud over my head. I'm not, I'm not chronically depressed, even though I recognize that the, you know, the country and the world is heading into uh, probably a pretty difficult uh, period of history. But uh, you know, what I, what I would tell people is, you know, do everything you can to lead a purposeful life and to do it purposefully, and uh, take care of your business, make things happen. Understand that there's a difference between wishing for stuff and making things happen um, uh, and make good choices. You know, don't uh, young people especially uh, are going to have to uh, make choices about where they're going to live and the kind of occupations and vocations that they adopt. Um, and they, you know, they're in a position where they, they might make, make bad choices. I don't think it would be a good idea to go into finance right now, go into the city of London. Um, uh, you know, that, that is going to be a very chaotic place very shortly. Um, I, I think it is probably would be important to learn how to do many practical things that, that might become trades. Um, and I think, it, you know, you have to be very careful about what place you select to live in. I don't think that London is going to be a particularly good choice, nor will New York City or Chicago or Los Angeles. Um, so, you know, there are those things to consider and, and there are some things, you know, we can't control everything. You can't go around wringing your hands all the time because you, you can't control stuff. One of the conceits of our time is the idea that just because you can measure a lot of things, you can control them, you know, and that's where this uh, mania for, quote, studies, unquote, you know, uh, arises in the United States where everybody is always citing studies of this and that to, to, to demonstrate you know, some fact about this and that. But, you know, in the end, it may not be something that you can control. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, 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 be prepared to go local, uh, work at, at uh, constructing a social network for yourself because it is a construction job. It is something that takes a lot of actual effort to do it. Um, learn how to do a few practical things, um, and, uh, uh, find people, uh, to spend time with who, who, uh, you love. And, uh, that's a recipe for remaining cheerful, even while everyone around you is walking around wringing their hands. Yeah, well, I think my reflection on that idea is simply that, you know, even during the so-called dark ages, people still lived and loved and got married, had children, created art, made music, laughed. You know, all these that things. was precisely the reason that I wrote these four novels under the general rubric World Made by Hand. I wanted to depict for people, for readers, this future world of uh, much leaner economic prospects where people still did what you said. You know, they, they still loved other people. They still found joy. They still made music. They still... Uh, um, consorted with their neighbors and and worked at things that were meaningful. So that is the whole point. Okay, James, today we've been talking about issues arising from your book, The Geography of Nowhere, The Rise and Decline of America's Man-Made Landscape. That's widely available, all the usual sources. It's also available as an e-book currently. So uh, just share with listeners details of your website. As I say, your blog is also uh, located there and just anything else you'd like to put out there well all right um most of you know if you look up k-u-n-s-t-l-e-r on uh amazon you'll get a pretty good list of all my books they're all there um you know and i would urge you to buy them at an independent bookseller if that was possible my website is www.kunstler.com k-u-n-s-t-l-e-r.com and my, we, my blog comes out every Monday and every Friday before 10 o'clock Eastern New York, uh, Eastern USA time. And it's called Clusterfuck Nation. And I discuss the uh, events of, of the day and the week. So that's where you can find me. Splendid. Well, James, once again, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. A pleasure to be free and legalized with you. <laughs>